If you're familiar with Filipino weapons, particularly those used by the Moros, then you'll almost certainly know the Barong and the Keris. These are really famous. But do you know this obscure weapon? Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So, as mentioned, you will probably know the Keris, the big Moro sword here, or indeed the Barong. Both of these were used extensively with or without a shield or alongside other weapons such as firearms, bows and spears. Um, in the Moro uprisings most famously. So a lot of these came back to uh, America and Europe at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. However, these are weapons that have been in use in the Philippines for quite some time. And in fact, the Philippines, if you're not aware, contain an enormous variety of edged weapons. They really, really love their variety and different cultural groups, different tribal groupings had preferences for different types of Philippine weapons. Now, in the future I might compare these two weapons because they were used side by side and some people preferred one and some people preferred the other. I have my own preference, can you guess which it is? Um, but the weapon that we're going to look at in this video isn't one of these because these are pretty famous and the reason is because this video is in my obscure weapons series. So check out that playlist if you haven't done already and make sure that you have liked and subscribed to get updates of similar videos to this. So what is the weapon that we're going to be looking at here? Well this is a new acquisition so I run an antiques company Eastern Antique, Antique Arms and therefore new things are constantly coming through my company which give me obviously good opportunities to make videos about them and this one only came to me the other day. I've never had one before and it's also not widely known, certainly not as widely known as the Chris, the Curris, or the uh, Barong. So what is it? Well, here it is. Do you know what it is? Do you know what this weapon is? Do you know anything about this? Do you know what it was used for? Do you know which side the edge is on? So this is called the Panabas, which is actually a shortened uh, phrase which comes from a longer term which basically means a chopping knife or chopping sword. And this is one of the weapons alongside the Keris and the Barong that was used by the Moros in, the, in that uprising, but equally it was used uh, in the Philippines by all sorts of people for various purposes. We'll get to that in a second. And you'll notice this is a very different type of weapon to the Keris or the Barong. Those are both distinctively and recognizably large knives or short swords. This, well this is something quite different isn't it? And that's why I thought it fits perfectly in my obscure weapon series. So as I say this is the first one I've ever had. I think this is the first one I've ever held. I did know what it was and I've seen them in museums. In fact you can find examples of this in places such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the British Museum, and you can find them for sale on the antique um, trade, within the antique trade. Now a lot of people have described this in uh, two rather incorrect ways. If you look on the internet and search for Panabas, you'll find places like Wikipedia and other articles which actually often repeat Wikipedia, that's a terrible um, aspect of modern internet life, um, that actually repeat some kind of wrong facts. And I'm going to hit you with the two main wrong facts you will read about these. The first is that these are a Filipino form of axe. Well, it's not an axe, it has a tang going into the handle like this and 50% of it is blade. Um, yes, admittedly it does have a long handle, it's got one of the longest hilts of any, any Filipino weapon other than spears of course, um, but it is very much not an axe, it's not secured to the shaft in a normal axe way with a socket and equally it is a blade above a handle, so uh, it doesn't project forward of a handle. So I don't think it's right to call it an axe at all. In fact, it's most similar to something like a dadao or a glaive. Um, in other words, it's a sword on a stick. And admittedly, it's not a particularly long shaft, but it has more in common with glaives, or indeed with barongs, than it does with any kind of axe, as far as I'm concerned. The second thing you'll read, um, on a surprising number of websites, which isn't entirely wrong, but it, which is usually wrong, is that it is a forwards curved cutting edge, in other words, that way. Well, this one isn't, and neither are most of the others. So if you look at the examples in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, for example, or just if you just Google image search them, you will see that the vast majority of Panabas are actually edged on this side. Which makes it even less like an axe, of course, because a lot of these um, websites will describe this as a 
forwards curving blade. Well, it's completely the opposite. It's a backwards curving blade. Okay, so it's far more like a saber or a falchion or a glaive than it is anything like an axe. Okay, the the edge is actually behind the line of access, um, uh, line of line of um, uh, kind of striking, as it were, and uh, the moment. And essentially, it comes back like this. And this is completely thick. And blunt on the back here um, and it does have these decorative piercings um, and serrations you could call them it's actually completely decorative rather than anything uh, functional probably some kind of uh, status symbol or ceremonial um, but this side is completely blunt this side I'm not going to run my hand along because it is very much sharp so there we go those are the cup the two main myths that I want to dispel so what is this Panabas well it's a very very interesting weapon actually the hilts to it if we if we call it that the grip is actually not that dissimilar in my opinion from a da from a Burmese da and I suspect that there's actually a relationship here so when we actually look at the history of the da or Darb as it's called in some places, which you find in Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, and so on. When you look at the history of that, it's actually somewhat obscure, and we don't know exactly when or where the Dar originates. All we know is that it spreads across a large swathe of Southeast Asia, is adopted by a lot of cultures. And actually, if you look at the construction, I suspect that this is back in hundreds of years ago, probably about the 16th, 17th century, this is what the Dar evolved into in the Philippines. So in my opinion, this is most likened to the Da. This is essentially the Filipino Da, in my opinion. Right, okay, if we look at the construction of the handle, so we have a thick, the blade essentially turns into a tang as it enters into the hardwood shaft. And this one is very beautifully um, ribbed, spirally, gives a fantastic grip. And if you look at the cross section, you can see that it is ovoid it is not round so absolutely you can index you can feel which direction the edge is as soon as the thing is in your hand and it can't turn in the hand which is better than most dar i have to say um, so i really really like this grip and then the wood continues all the way up to here but shrouded the top part of the wood because that would be prone to splitting in use it is this one is completely sheathed in a brass or at least copper alloy sleeve essentially so that is like a giant ferrule which prevents the metal part of the weapon bursting out of the wooden part of the weapon okay so this is a little bit like a socket on a spear for example or indeed at the top of a dar the construction is very simple sim similar to lots of dar now it should be noted that this particular example, which is wood and brass, is not necessarily completely typical in that a lot of them don't have that metallic element. They actually do it with rattan. So when you look up original examples of these, you will find that a lot of them have braided rattan around here, usually around here, sometimes down here as well, at various intervals. So I suspect that the oldest ones actually have rattan binding up here to prevent the wood splitting. And then later on, when perhaps metal was a bit more available, they shrouded it in metal. This incidentally probably dates to the 19th century. It could conceivably be from around 1900, 1910, um, because, of course, the design stayed the same, and if you look at the weapons that the Moros were using, of this Barong, in those Moro uprisings, despite the fact that they were fighting the Americans um, and formerly the Spanish, um, with sort of modern bolt-action rifles and so on and so forth, they were using very traditional weapons uh, in large part. So the weapons they were using in 1900 to 1910 were the same weapons that they would have been using in 1800 or 1810. And that was true of the... Panabas as well, and the Panabas, as far as we can tell, goes all the way back into at least the 18th century, probably earlier than that, which also adds credence, I think, to the idea that it's related to the Da. So, hardwood grip, uh, metal binding at the top, essentially a ferrule to stop it bursting. Um, you will notice it is very thick at the back here. And just look at that thick, thick spine. That's around a centimetre thick at the back so it's got a really thick section and the bottom of the blade although it's very obtuse edge uh, geometry is sharp it's sharpened all the way down to here and a very characteristic feature of these 
is they essentially have a little rocasso here. So if you look at lots of them, you will see that they will kick out slightly there, project outwards. And the reason is because for safety reasons, that bit is not edged. So if your hand were to slide up, you're not going to cut your hand there. You'll get to a little ledge, much like on a cookery or various types of other knife, and the edge only starts above that. Now, above that point, obviously the edge geometry gets more favorable for cutting so that it is really very sharp, and it has distal taper. For those of you who don't know, that means essentially that the blade is very thick here, let's say about a centimeter. It comes down to about eight millimeters, then it's down to about five millimeters, and then all the way down to about probably three millimeters near the tip. So it distally tapers this way, which gives it a, a much more nimble and light feeling in the hand than would immediately appear how it might feel just if it was a flat slab. So it has very uh, distinctive distal taper and the blade, while it's very broad here, is very thin and flat and it does taper to a point and theoretically, absolutely, these could be used for thrusting. In fact, this has lost the very tip, unfortunately, it's been uh, cracked off in use. Um, you could use it for thrusting, you could use it for push cutting, definitely. I think they're predominantly chopping weapons, but nevertheless, you could thrust with it at a pinch. Usually, these panabas are broader near the tip, and sometimes the fancy ones like this have decoration on the back. Very occasionally, they are edged on the inside and the blunt edge is on this side. Okay, so there are some that are forwards curved that will chop like a, like a sickle or a scythe or a cookery, but most of them are edged this way. <laughs> Notice I'm not hitting my hand now. Uh, most of them are edged this way and cut more like a sabre or a falchion. Um, now, another important aspect to mention is that weapons made in the Philippines were made of a variety of different available steels. So later period ones were made of whatever steel they could get hold of or trade uh, or loot in some cases. Um, so sometimes trail, uh, steel was traded in from places like China um, or Europe and was used to make barongs and um, cuirasses and various other things. However, traditionally, these are made of laminated steel and you can actually see the structure and see how close I can get the blade here. You can see the structure and pummel, or essentially pattern welded pattern, in the blade, which you can get glimpses of here. Now, I haven't, I've only cleaned this blade up slightly, but if this were to be slightly more cleaned up and polished up and then re etched, you'd actually see a pattern in this blade. So, this is essentially a not quite pattern welded, but a laminated blade with a structure and a pretty pattern in it, basically as you would find on many um, Indonesian Chris, for example. So, now what was this for? So we know, we can look at the Barong and the Keris and we can see basically what they were for. You will again read various explanations of what these were for. Primarily, they were weapons, but they also seem to have sometimes served a ceremonial purpose and sometimes kind of a tool. So the first thing they're not, okay, is a general purpose garden tool. They are not simply for chopping weeds and clearing a way through a forest, okay? They seem to be far more high status than that and a lot more work gone into them. They're not just a general lopper, although they could be used for that and I suspect they were sometimes used for that. They were sometimes used for chopping meat. Now, that's not as mundane as it sounds because sometimes chopping meat meant sacrificing animals and sacrificing animals had a religious purpose and a cultural purpose. And connected to that, so did execution. So sometimes you'll see these described as executioners choppers, okay, for killing, for example, prisoners. And it does seem they were used for that. So clearly something which is good for chopping meat or good for chopping fish will also work for chopping humans and it was put to that purpose. They were also used as weapons, either one-handed or two-handed. Clearly you've got a long enough grip, so you could absolutely use this as a two-handed weapon, but you can completely comfortably use this as a one-handed weapon, either by itself or with some form of shield. It's really quite maneuverable um, and quite nimble. Okay, it's kind of the same weight as a tomahawk. 
So absolutely this can be a one-handed weapon or a two-handed weapon. Yes, they were used as weapons. Yes, they were sometimes carried by tribal chiefs with a ceremonial purpose, a status symbol. Yes, they were sometimes used for executions or sometimes for sacrificial purposes. Um, and all of the above. So one of these weapons, this particular weapon, which is probably late 19th century, could have been used for executions, could have been used for sacrifice, could have been used in war, could have been used in the moral uprisings. All of those things. It doesn't have to be any particular one of those. What we can say, therefore, is we, let's not call it an executioner's sword, let's not call it a ceremonial sword, let's just call it Panabas, <laughs> okay? That's the name of it, and they were used for all of these things. And one final detail about the Panabas, a somewhat gruesome one, it has to be said, and I haven't completely fact-checked this, but it seems plausible. I have read in a couple of places that these were sometimes used by second-line troops. So the primary-line troops might be using spears um, with things like barongs or um, keris, as their sidearms, together with shields. Shields were extensively used by uh, the Moros as well, and they had armour some of the time as well. So they would have been probably the front lines, and I have read that sometimes, because these were such effective choppers and they were used in executions and ceremonial purposes, that sometimes there would be people coming up in the rear lines with these to kill fallen enemies um, and that's entirely possible if you're in the type of conflict where you intend to take no prisoners then this is a logical weapon of for dispatching people um, in a similar way we know hatchets were used in the hundred years war by um, english soldiers um, against wounded french for example in the hundred years war so within that context although i've argued this is not an axe it does perhaps fulfill some of the same purposes as an axe when it comes to fighting and execution and things like this. So here we go, the Panabas. I hope that has been educational to some of you. Um, even if you knew that this was a Panabas, maybe you didn't know all of the things. Uh, let me down, know down in the comments, did you know that this was a Panabas? Have you ever heard of a Panabas? Do you know anything more about Panabas that I haven't mentioned in this video? Um, and can you recommend any other things I can go to research and look at? Because I think it's an absolutely fascinating weapon and what a great thing to have in my hands. Um, thank you again for watching. Thank you to my uh, patrons, incidentally, who make this channel possible. Uh, please make sure that you've given me a like. Please make sure you've subscribed and hopefully you'll be around to find out about the next obscure weapon in my obscure weapons playlist. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.